Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, Distinguished Speakers um, Series seminar organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance. I'm Daryl Chen, Deputy Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and Deputy Chairman of the Academy of Finance. Today's seminar will be in hybrid form. We have um, around 60 guests here joining us um, on site. And we have um, around 900 guests Ooh. registered online. A really big turnout. <laughs> <laughs> the seminar will be recorded and uploaded um, onto the Academy's website and uh, YouTube. We have about an hour, and I will reserve some time towards the end of the seminar uh, for Q&As. Our distinguished speaker today is Richard Carrada. There are many ways to address Richard. Um, former Assistant Secretary for Treasury, US Treasury, former Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Professor at Columbia University, and Dr. Carrada as PIMCO's uh, Global Economic Advisor. So this is your second tour uh, back to PIMCO, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, very interesting and distinguished career indeed. Um, Dr. Carrada is also an old friend. Uh, for six years, between 2012 and 2018, he served on the Council of Advisor of the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary Research, which has now become part of the Academy of Finance. Richard, a very warm welcome back to Hong Kong. Um, it's our great pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, we have quite a few questions to cover. So, Good. Um, so let me start with the first set of questions, um, which is about um, monetary policy as well as the macro. Um, now, two weeks ago um, at the ECB Forum on Central Banking in Portugal, um, the chiefs of major central banks sounded quite uh, hawkish. So what's your take on the stubbornness of um, inflation and possible path of monetary conditions in developed markets going forward? And realistically, should we brace for um, higher, uh, for longer uh, interest rate situation and how much higher, how much longer? <laughs> um, and the third question is, um, there's a sense that the last mile getting uh, inflation back down to 2% is extremely challenging. So my question is, now how sacrosanct is that 2%? Um, is there any scope that uh, we might well, move the goalposts a bit? Well, okay, I think you loaded maybe uh, three questions into one, so I'll, I'll address them uh, in turn. Um, so I think that um, uh, inflation, I think we've seen, the good news mm -hmm. is I think we've seen peak inflation. Um, but, um, and I think we've also seen uh, most of the heavy lifting that central banks are gonna need to do, at least the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of England, they, they've already done. So I think they've gotten rates uh, into uh, uh, restrictive uh, territory. Uh, but I think inflation this year is proving to be more sticky and stubborn uh, than they hoped uh, mm. or uh, uh, expected. Um, in terms of uh, what I would, I, th I think each of the major, uh, uh, those three central banks uh, will, uh, will need and will, will need to and will hike uh, 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 some more. Uh, I think that uh, especially the Fed uh, has had to push back against market uh, pricing and sentiment mm -hmm. um, that it would do all this heavy lifting to get rates into restrictive territory and then turn around <laughs> soon thereafter and start cutting. Right. Um, and, and I think they, at this point in July, they've done a pretty good job, so market pricing now does not have any uh, real cuts uh, until uh, uh, next year. Uh, I do agree, mm. uh, Daryl, uh, that um, there is a, the last mile is gonna be challenging. Uh, I've long thought, now focusing on the Fed, I've long thought that as a practical matter, uh, the, the Powell uh, Fed, uh, is really focused on bringing inflation down in the what I call the two point something mm. uh, range. Uh, you know they would like that to be 2.0, but even in their own uh, projections, uh, they have inflation uh, above two percent next year mm. and only getting close to two percent uh, in 2025. 20, uh, 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 importantly, the Fed recognizes 
uh, that, um, uh, that uh, they will be inclined uh, to cut rates before inflation gets to 2%. Uh, the rationale mm. simply being that if inflation does fall into the twos, uh, then keeping rates uh, at elevated levels is actually tightening policy further, and so they may want to downshift rates once they start to get good traction uh, on uh, uh, inflation. Um, so I think, I think central banks uh, will, those central banks and others, uh, will do what it takes to keep inflation expectations uh, uh, anchored. Um, but it will be a challenge because for most of the next several years and for most of the last hmm. past several years, inflation's been above target. So I think that's the, the state of play uh, right now. Hmm. But it's also mention of average of 2%. Does it mean that actually they're going to tolerate, well, actually the inflation being above the 2% for a sustained period. What, yeah. What's your take on that? Well, I was, I was part of the Fed uh, on the committee when we did uh, refine our, our framework in August of 2020, and we said that uh, we, said that, uh, we would like uh, for inflation to average 2% over time. Hmm. The idea there is we felt it was important to convey that effective monetary policy um, does not uh, view or try to achieve 2% uh, as a ceiling, because after all, uh, if 2% is a ceiling, uh, then over time, average inflation will drift below the 2% uh, mm. target. And so we, we, we simply acknowledged in the new framework in August of 2020 uh, that policy uh, would, uh, would allow inflation to move above 2% after it had been below uh, 2%. It's important to note, however, and indeed I, I gave a speech in August of 2021 uh, at the Peterson Institute, uh, in which I made it clear that it, even by that time, mm. in August of 2021, uh, it was clear that inflation um, had averaged and would average uh, more than uh, two uh, percent. So I think the I think the overshoot in inflation we've seen in the U.S. Mm. and in in most other uh, uh, countries um, is really less to do with the particular framework. Uh, that the central banks pursued, and much more to do uh, with the, the nature uh, of the significant shocks that mm -hmm. have hit the global economy. You know, we had the, uh, we had the initial uh, pandemic, which was a public health catastrophe. Uh, we had an economic collapse, which thankfully did not turn into a financial crisis, but we had a collapse in economic activity as we shut down mm -hmm. big parts of the global economy. There was a reopening shock. Indeed, in retrospect, you know, the one thing that we did not appreciate at the Fed uh, in real time was how costly um, and, how, and how much dislocation would be caused by the reopening right. of the global economy. Um, uh, in addition, of course, there was very substantial fiscal and monetary support uh, that certainly in the U.S. case turned out uh, to be uh, excessive, you know, relative to the economy's mm. potential. Uh, and thus the Fed has been in the mode really of trying to slow and bring back aggregate demand back towards um, a, a target. Uh, so it's been a very eventful several uh, years, uh, but, but again, I think the average uh, inflation uh, objective is one in and of itself that was met pretty early on in the process, uh, and the subsequent overshoot is really more about, I think, the, the complexity and the size of the shocks. Okay. Now, let's move from uh, interest rate and then to um, uh, uh, economy. So, um, reportedly, PIMCO's view is to prepare for a harder landing. Yeah. Um, although your view is that, okay, soft landing is the more, most likely uh, outcome. Uh -huh. So, can you elaborate on that view? Yeah, there are different landings uh, that you read about uh, on the financial press. There's the there's the soft landing. Uh, there's what I've called and we've called the softish uh, landing. Um, then I guess there is hard landing, and then some folks talk about no landing. <laughs> um, uh, I think on when it comes to to um, to, to landing, uh, let me lay out to me what I think is a a, a, a reasonable uh, baseline uh, a scenario. Um, so the Fed will succeed in slowing uh, the growth in the uh, economy. Uh, we'll get some measurable rise in the unemployment rate, say up to between four and a half and five uh, percent. 
Um, and uh, inflation then falls from the current level so to somewhere in the twos uh, by the middle of next year. Now, I would consider that a pretty good outcome. Yeah. Certainly, if I were still at the Fed, I'd sign up for that. <laughs> that would technically be considered a recession, uh, uh, at least in the past, whenever the unemployment rate in a downturn has moved up uh, by more than half a percentage point, that has been designated a recession. That's called the the SOM rule after a former Fed staffer, Claudia SOM. Uh, so I think in some ways um, the discussion's a little bit uh, confused because it focuses on whether it be a recession or not a recession. I think a technical recession will be hard to avoid mm. uh, given that the Fed itself thinks that there will need to be some weak softening in the labor market in order to bring wage inflation uh, down. Um, but, but still, the scenario I laid out to me would look like a pretty soft or softish uh, landing. Uh, you know, the risk case, I think, at this point is that inflation turns out and proves to be uh, very sticky and mm. stubborn. Um, and, and then the choice uh, the Fed would face is whether or not it needs to continue ratcheting rates up, you know, at the risk of a harder uh, landing. So I think that is what you were referring to in that quote. That's not the base case, mm -hmm. but it's certainly uh, something that you know investors would need to uh, to factor in. Right. So in that respect, what do you think would be the implications uh, on the developed countries and potential spillover to yeah. um, the emerging economies? Yeah. Well, that's always an issue, and uh, you know, contrary to uh, myth or popular belief, you know, certainly when I was a Fed official. Uh, we were you know, very much being briefed and trying to understand the spillover effects mm. of our policies on the rest of the world. Uh, we spent a lot of time in international meetings yes. uh, at, the, at the BIS and in other forums to try to communicate our reaction function and to learn from other central bankers uh, about, uh, about their, their reaction function and uh, objectives for their policy. But you know, at the end of the day, the Fed's mandate is, is in statute uh, by Congress, which is U.S. inflation and mm -hmm. U.S. employment. And so the Fed will, will set the monetary policy that it needs to to achieve its U.S. Uh, objectives. But international factors are a consideration. You know, the uh, uh, policy is transmitted not only through interest rates, yep. but also exchange rates and trade flows. And so it's certainly a part of the Fed's uh, 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 thinking. Um, uh, I think that historically, uh, the adverse spillovers from U.S. policy uh, to the rest of the world, you know, have tended to be associated um, uh, with um, with uh, you know rate hikes in which the Fed has been endeavoring to reduce inflation, um, and that is the circumstance in which we find ourselves now. What's been uh, Daryl, what's mm. been uh, surprising, pleasantly surprising uh, to me, uh, is at least thus far uh, how well you know many uh, emerging or emerged economies you know have navigated yeah. this cycle. You know, in some cases, being early and ahead of the curve on hiking uh, rates. Um, and so, I think that the picture now is is a pretty constructive one. Again, all of the economies are navigating. Uh, you know, the, the, the shutdown, the reopening, and the complexities of the post-COVID uh, economy. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think part of that also had to do with the sort of reforms, the lessons they learned from previous crises, uh -huh. and then the buffer they, they tr tried yeah. to build over time so yeah. that they get them better prepared yeah. uh, in case of such a crisis. But in a sense, I think the, um, the sort of the US dollar facility that the Fed actually put in place. Uh, the swap to, uh, yeah, facilities? That, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that helped uh, yes. in, in actually calming the markets. Uh, that was an innovation introduced uh, by, uh, at the, by the Bernanke uh, Fed, and it certainly, and of course there are a set of standing facilities in place, and then in 2020, we expanded the access the to the FEMA, facilities yeah. to a broader number of countries, also the, the FEMA uh, yeah. repo uh, facility. Um, yeah, that really helped. Um, now let's move on to the second question, which, uh, which is about uh, market communication. Yeah. Okay. So um, central bank, including the Fed, has increased transparency in the communication of monetary policy. But from time to time, there seems to be some degree of disconnect <laughs> between oh, yeah. um, market expectations and Fed's 
own um, expectation as communicated. So you have served both in central bank as well as um, in, in the market. So how do you interpret um, such um, misconnect? Is it because there are certain things that central banks know but the market doesn't, or the other way around? Uh, and um, understandably, um, the credibility of central bank is crucial in fighting inflation. So do you think there's anything the central bank can do uh, more to well, actually uh, convey the, um, uh, the right message to the market? It is a, um, it's certainly something that we, and I'm sure you all here, it's certainly certain the simple central bankers do focus on and take seriously, mm -hmm. which is trying to be as transparent as is uh, possible about reaction function and mm -hmm. intentions, uh, but also trying to convey you know, some of the complexities of the decision uh, uh, making um, I, I do think this year we've seen several bouts of a, of a disconnect between market pricing and Fed uh, uh, communication. Uh, I think right now there's actually a pretty good connectivity between mm. what the Fed thinks it's going to do and what markets are uh, pricing in. I think, and we discussed this a bit uh, earlier, uh, that I do think earlier this year uh, we saw episodes where the Fed was indicating both through mm -hmm. its projections and commentary by officials uh, that it wanted to continue to hike rates, get them to a restrictive level, and then keep mm -hmm. them there. And the markets were actually pricing in oh. that the Fed would begin to cut, at least at one point, as soon as the July meeting, certainly the September uh, meeting. Uh, I think that the Powell Fed and, uh, has pushed back against mm -hmm. that uh, successfully now. Uh, sometimes the disconnect, I think, is more apparent uh, than uh, real, in mm. particular between market pricing for rate path uh, and the Fed's um, uh, SEP uh, projections. And, and the sort of uh, technical reason for that is that for a variety of reasons, uh, the Fed's projections of the interest rate path um, are not the means of probability distributions they're individual modal outcomes that are then aggregated via uh, a median. And so you have, at full strength, you'll have 19 people at an FOMC meeting, and each of them will submit a projection not only for economic growth and inflation, but will also submit a projection for mm -hmm. the, the path for rates. Um, and, um, and so the Fed does not actually have a official Fed forecast of the economy nor an official Fed forecast of the path the rates. It has 19 forecast, and then it takes mm -hmm. the median of those to convert that into some sort of set of, of numbers. Um, and in particular, around turning points, um, even if the Fed and markets agree on everything, you can have the median dot differing from market pricing, because mm -hmm. markets are pricing in the entire distribution, the worst case scenario, the best case scenario. And so I think early in the year, there was maybe less of a disconnect than there appeared. But certainly, I think uh, around the time of SVB and some of those dislocations, there was a pretty big gulf uh, between uh, Fed communication and, and pricing that I think has largely been resolved by now. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, my next question is about uh, financial stability. So yeah. the central banks always struggle between, two. okay, you've got your mandate, but financial stability, to what extent you can really push that limit? Um, so um, during your tenure uh, at um, the Fed, COVID struck, yeah. and the Fed actually promptly introduced a range of uh, very forceful measures in March 2020. So to the extent that you can tell this audience, um, how do you look at that crisis and formulate the policy response your priorities then and the trade-offs that uh, you factor yeah. in. Um, so I, I think it would be very interesting sure. for us. Well, um, so it was, I should also remind us, uh, each of us, uh, what we knew and what we didn't know at what, at what time. Um, because um, uh, I, I've documented this, I gave an interview, a live interview on CNBC in February mm. of uh, 2020 with Steve uh, Leisman. Um, and Steve asked me the way that I was factoring in uh, the COVID uh, situation into my U.S. outlook, and my answer was something along the lines of that uh, the pandemic may impact you know, U.S. exports to China. But, but at that point, even in late February, we were not processing um, the scenario where it would become a, a worldwide mm. 
uh, pandemic. At that point, there had been no community transmission in the U.S., uh, as has been uh, documented in several recent uh, books uh, on that period. Um, uh, so, so Jay Powell had been at an international G20 meeting, and when he returned uh, last week of February, uh, he he reached out to me and basically said, "Rich, you know, we need to start we need to start thinking about all mm. possibilities." Uh, scenarios vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, 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 the pandemic. Um, uh, one, I, I can share with you, because it's been written about in, this, in these books uh, accurately, uh, is uh, there was a, 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 um, a small meeting of, of Chair Powell, myself, and a number of staff members, and the staff was going around various ways to factor in potential pandemic mm -hmm. scenarios into our outlook. Um, and, and Jay looked at me and said, so Rich, you know, what's the worst case scenario, uh, the global financial crisis? And I said, no, uh, Chair Powell, the worst case scenario is the Great Depression. Uh, and I said that without exaggeration because I was beginning to contemplate mm. how, how does a, a modern economy function if companies have no revenues and workers have no wages? How do you make your car rental payments? How do you, how do you make your mortgage payments? Uh, uh, because at that point, we were beginning to contemplate, you know, shutdowns, uh, lockdowns, um, and, and, and obviously there was a public health catastrophe, but we were thinking uh, about the economic implications mm. uh, uh, at that point. Um, we then responded, I think, both creatively um, and, and, and quickly. I think implicitly, although we never discussed it uh, out loud, I think implicitly we recognized that this was not going to play out over six or 12 or 18 months like the GFC mm. did, the crisis thing. I think we knew that we only had a limited amount of time, maybe weeks, you know, to get it right in terms of the policy response. Uh, you know, so under Jay Powell's leadership, uh, we very quickly, by the 15th of March, uh, went all in. We cut rates to zero. We announced uh, an unlimited uh, QE program. Uh, we then, the week of March 16th, uh, st uh, in introduced, reintroduced programs that the Bernanke Fed had developed to support liquidity in the commercial paper and the money market mutual uh, funds. Uh, the treasury market was dysfunctional. Indeed, probably the most daunting period to me, I think, was Tuesday, March 16th, uh, when we were buying large volumes of treasuries and interest rates kept going up. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, I sort of feel like a, I sort of feel like a pilot uh, in an airplane uh, in, a, in a storm in which uh, I'm, the instruments aren't working and I'm trying to <laughs> land the plane that's running uh, low on fuel. Because uh, all the things you think you should do to support the economy, cut rates to zero and buy bond, bond yields were going up. Um, it was a very, very, very uh, challenging uh, uh, period. And then finally, uh, on March 23rd, uh, we announced something. We really did, if you will, break the glass, given the, the nature of the circum pandemic circumstances. We announced programs that the staff had developed really within a week uh, to support, directly support the corporate bond market and the municipal bond uh, market. Uh, the programs were designed to be backstops. Mm. The Fed never wanted to be the lender of first uh, resort. We wanted to be the lender of last resort. But we wanted to be a backstop in, in case uh, capital markets cease uh, to function. Uh, in the end, it turned out that just the announcement of fact that we were going to introduce those programs really stabilized markets and reopened mm. the flow of credit uh, in the um, uh, um, economy. Uh, so I, I, I look at that period with, with great pride. I think it was fed uh, at its best, um, and uh, I think it will hold up and does hold up very well uh, in, uh, in, you know, over the test of time. I think you should be very proud of yourself being yeah. part of it, uh, this yeah. whole operation. Um, now, picking on your point about first resort, last resort, so yeah. um, my question is, is more at which point um, the regulators or the central bank should come in. So um, in times of crisis, swift and forceful um, policy reactions um, on the part of central banks are often needed to calm the market. Um, however, if the market believes the central bank um, will do whatever it takes um, to avert the so-called worst case scenario, as you just mentioned, yeah. 
there could be long-lasting unintended consequences or uh, moral yeah. hazards. So um, how do you see market participants positioning their risk management if they hold the belief that, well, if somehow the, com the central bank will come to our rescue, uh, believing yeah. that, well, this could be a scenario where it's, well, it might have a systemic uh, consequences. Yeah. Um, so so how, how, how do you, while you're in, in the driving seat, make a decision and trying to strike the right balance? Absolutely, and it's certainly something that I think we were cognizant of. I, I do think, and, and in fact, I said so at the time in an interview, uh, probably in April or May of 2020, uh, that um, I think in the narrow sense, we weren't that worried about moral hazard in setting up the corporate bond and the municipal programs as we did um, because we did not think we were rewarding reckless behavior for companies that borrowed too much because there might be a pandemic someday. So this was a truly exogenous, you know, meteor hits the earth situation. Um, and I think doing what it takes is appropriate. Uh, what I would say, however, and I have done some thinking on this, and if I get some time, I might write a more thoughtful essay uh, on it. Uh, I will say that um, we were very, uh, we were very uh, able on very short mm -hmm. notice to reintroduce the programs to support you know, money market functioning and commercial paper uh, markets you know, because the Bernanke Fed had introduced them um, and thus it was straightforward for us to reintroduce them. And so one of the things I've thought about uh, is if in a future, say more routine mm -hmm. downturn, you know, the US on average has a recession every eight years. So you know, in the next 100 years, there'll be 12 or 15 of them. And so I have done a little thinking about the issue of will a future Fed in a routine recession, mm -hmm. you know, unemployment rate rises by a couple of points and GDP growth is negative for three quarters, will a future Fed say, you know, the Powell Fed back in 2020 backstopped the corporate bond market and backstopped mm -hmm. the municipal bond market and it actually started a program for Main Street lending. You know, we should do that too. Um, you know, I think that would be a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, I think. We set these programs up. They had, a, they had a, an expiration date. Indeed, the programs were wound down, really we began to wind them down by the end of 2020. Uh, uh, we also, I should say, a more, more technical issue, but it's actually quite important. Um, the, feds, uh, the Fed interprets its mandate with regards to interventions in the financial system, especially for non-banks, um, in a pretty constrained way, mm. uh, in particular, the Fed's given wide authority to lend to banks against, against good collateral, and then sometimes to lend to less than, less than uh, well-managed uh, banks under certain circumstances. But, but the Fed is really limited in what it can mm -hmm. do under statute to non-banks, and in particular, it has to invoke something which is known as Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act, and, and that's the section that says that usually the Fed can't really lend to non-financial institutions, non-banking institutions, mm. uh, but if there are, quote, unusual and exigent circumstances, and I think that's <laughs> one of the rare times you'll see the word exigent outside of an SAT test, but in unusual <laughs> and exigent circumstances, the Fed uh, is given the authority uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, do, to do those programs. Um, I think the pandemic was an unusual mm. and exigent circumstance. I would not think a, that a routine recession uh, would be, uh, but it's certainly something uh, in the, that I have been uh, thinking uh, 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 about. Again, I wouldn't do it any differently, uh, but there always is the institutional dynamic that um, you know, once institutions establish a certain uh, set of options, they then become potentially available in, in future uh, circumstances. Yeah. So the banking turmoil earlier part of this year, yeah. you regarded as um, exertion, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, now, these days, any discussion? Well, in fact, maybe I should uh, uh, embellish on, on that. So the Fed actually did have to invoke 13.3 um, in the March, uh, the March programs to to uh, respond to the SVB mm. and the signature bank failures. And that was a bit puzzling at first uh, because the Fed was just lending to, to uh, banks. Um, 
but it was lending to banks uh, under special terms. First of all, uh, a regular discount window loan by the Fed to a bank is against uh, pre-pledged collateral with a haircut mm -hmm. for a limited term. And the program the Fed set up in March is um, to lend against collateral at par value, not against market value with a haircut, and for a term of one year. And so because the Fed was offering those more generous terms, it actually did invoke mm -hmm. Section 13.3, even though the even though the lending is to banks. Yeah, okay. Um, let's shift our um, gear a bit. Um, geopolitics. Yeah. Or um, um, geoeconomic fragmentation, however you call it. Um, that will increasingly loom large in business planning and your development strategy um, in both the real and financial sectors, I think. Um, so how do you see these um, changing the global trade and uh, inflation dynamics going forward? And uh, from PIMCO's perspective, so you, you have global operations. So yeah. internally, how do you perceive and manage those risks and how do you advise your client in dealing with these risks? Certainly, I think um, one thing that, Daryl, it's important to, or I always try to remind myself um, is, um, you know, ex ante, there's always an element of geopolitical risk somewhere. Political scientists and social scientists have developed indexes of geopolitical mm. risk, and they're never zero, <laughs> ex ante. Uh, you know, there was this one in my youth, and I'm dating myself now, but there was this, there was this clock, and as it got closer to midnight, you know, we were closer to... Uh, you know, nuclear exchange with, uh, with Russia. Right. Um, and of course, that never happened, <laughs> ex post, but ex ante, there was always that. So there's always some element of geopolitical uh, risk. Um, and I, just getting to the, from the uh, PIMCO uh, perspective, you know, broadly, when we're thinking about investing uh, you know, over numbers of years for uh, our clients, you know, uh, the, we can't afford to say we're only going to invest when there's geopolitical risk. So there's always an element there. You, you, know, you try to factor it in in terms of having portfolios that are robust uh, to different uh, scenarios. Moving it into the present, as you mentioned, I think there are a couple of things now that are going to be very relevant mm -hmm. uh, to both policymakers uh, and uh, investors and others in the next five years and, and beyond. Uh, one is this whole potential uh, remapping and rethinking of global uh, supply chains, uh, whether or not it takes the form of friendshoring or onshoring, uh, whether or not it takes the form of de-risking, or, or, or some say we don't believe in decoupling is particularly relevant. Um, a lot of governments, including now the U.S. government, is providing direct fiscal incentives for elements of, of, of that. Uh, it also, in some ways, is also... Uh, uh, related but distinct from the financing the green uh, transition as well. So I think that the magnitude of those effects on inflation are hard to quantify, but certainly the direction of travel is the remapping of global supply chains, onshoring, friendshoring, the green transition are all going to be factors that are going to be putting upward pressures on cost and potentially mm -hmm. upward pressures on, on um, uh, inflation. Um, you know, our, our, our baseline view is that central banks will do what it takes to keep inflation expectations uh, anchored. Um, but there is no doubt that those, those geo the consequences of those geopolitical risks are on net going to be, you know, putting upward pressure on, on, um, uh, on inflation. Which means it will be making the job of the central bank even harder right? yeah. in terms of containing um, uh, inflation. Yeah. And maybe I can give you one thing I can concretely say because it's looking backward instead of looking forward. Um, and indeed, one of the first uh, one of the first conversations I had uh, with, with with Jay Powell once I returned to the Fed was about the reality in the U.S. inflation data during that great moderation period from the early 1990s uh, until uh, 2020, um, is during that period, the US was trying to achieve an inflation rate of 2%, the Fed was, um, and it had a good track record. In fact, if anything, inflation was a little bit below 2% during a number of those years. Um, if you actually look at US inflation data during that period when, when inflation was around 2%, 
What was really going on behind the scenes was that services inflation was 3% or higher, and goods inflation was actually deflation. Mm -hmm. And so the parts of the economy that were exposed to globalization uh, and wages in those sectors exposed to globalization uh, were actually disinflating. Um, and that was offsetting service sector inflation that was above two. And so one of the challenges mm. the Powell Fed, and I think other central banks have faced, has been that what was keeping inflation lower mm. and keeping it around the 2% targets was um, the fact that goods were actually deflating because of the efficiency of global supply chains and, and the globalization of at least trading goods. Um, and so, you know, to the extent the post-pandemic world with redrawn supply chains and the like uh, produces a different set of uh, forces, you know, that's going to make central banks' jobs yeah. harder going forward. It doesn't mean they can't hit their targets. It just means they'll have to do more work uh, to do so. Okay, not a bad thing then to have left uh, the Fed, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my, my next question is on um, generative AI because yes. I think it's a, pre a subject that uh, people feel very interested in. Um, and it's thought that this has great potential to really revolutionize uh, finance, um, if not the future of, ma um, of mankind. So uh, my question is, um, how would generative AI bring changes the world of finance, business model, or internal governance, or even risk management? Well, I think the, the honest and brief answer is probably too soon to tell, but certainly uh, you know, I and, 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 uh, and, and PIMCO is in the camp that thinks it's potentially a very big uh, deal. Um, I think the honest answer, though, Daryl, is uh, that you know, historically revolutionary technologies uh, take a while to be broadly and widely adopted. Um, there is there's good reason to believe that large language model AI uh, may have a much more rapid adoption mm. curve, simply because a lot of the infrastructure to adapt it is already there, essentially. It's disseminated mm. via you know, broadband internet on a set of servers uh, you know, in the cloud that are already there. You know, so it's not like if you had a factory that was run off steam engines, you had to completely resign, redesign it when you put in electrical motors or whatever. So, so it could be very quick adoption. Mm. I think what makes it both um, interesting um, and, and difficult right now to forecast um, is that even if you are in the camp uh, that's a believer that it's going to revolutionize uh, commerce and, and the economy, you know, it's not clear what direction it's going to have for example, on, on interest uh, rates. There are those who argue uh, that, uh, that large language models mm -hmm. are going to be very, very disinflationary in that they are going to lower the cost of a lot of service and human capital intensive activity. On the other hand, there are other folks, and sometimes the same folks who mm -hmm. argue that large language models are gonna rapidly boost productivity growth. So, you know, more rapid growth will tend to push up bond yields uh, more significant disinflation will tend to push down yields. And so um, I think it could be a very big deal, but it's not obvious, at least over the next five to 10 years, mm -hmm. in what direction it goes. I guess near term, the one thing that is obvious uh, is that you know, if you are a company that has a demonstrated, uh, a demonstrated expertise uh, in, in, in AI and large language models, your, your stock is gonna do very well in the stock market. <laughs> so I think the equity implications may be pretty clear for certain companies, which I won't mention by name, but we all know who some of them are, so. Yeah, but anything that you think many of the financial institutions here should get themselves prepared. I mean, this yeah. is going to and be a and wave and of and a revolution. And at PIMCO, we, we have an internal group uh, that has been really since I returned in October uh, and probably before then, uh, have is, is 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 focused on that and ways it can improve uh, improve our 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 functioning. Mm. Yeah.
Okay, good. It's just such an exciting area. Yeah. You just have to watch out. Um, my next question is on green and sustainable finance. I think yeah. this is a subject that every major financial institution cannot just ignore. Um, can you just share a bit what um, PIMCO is doing in that yeah. space and, and what do you see as actually the sort of challenges that um, institutions like PIMCO would have to face uh, in this particular yeah. space? Well, uh, you know, PIMCO has been very active in that, uh, but with a real focus on being responsive to the, the request and the interest um, of our uh, clients. Um, and uh, we do so in a number of ways. One, we have a number of our, a number of our funds that we offer, our mutual hmm. funds. You know, we offer uh, versions of those that meet the objectives of, of meeting certain uh, criteria that clients uh, a favor. We've also actively participate in international uh, groups on, you know, sort of thinking about standardization of criteria mm -hmm. for ranking and evaluating green uh, 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 investments. But the, the basic theme at PIMCO is to do so in a way that meets the desires and interests uh, of our clients and, 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 and essentially partnering with them uh, in investing in ways that, that make sense for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I noticed that we are sort of running out of time. So my last question, um, well, when I plan thought about this question, I was planning that I should perhaps put up a photo, play a small clip, uh, <laughs> but then I was advised mm -hmm. that, okay, you better sort out your IP or intellectual property issue before you uh, mm -hmm. do it. Uh, so for many of the folks here, if you feel interested, just search the web for Time No Changes by uh, Richard Carrader which is an album you released uh, back in yeah. uh, 2016, right? Exactly. Uh, you yeah. wrote the songs, the lyrics, and the vocals yours, right? It's all me. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, no, and no AI, so... Uh, <laughs> and no, and, and no auto-tune. Um, well, one syllable on one song, I used auto-tune, but everything else is, is me, yeah. Right, okay. What prompted you actually to release that album? Well, I grew up in a musical household. My father was a professional jazz musician and a music teacher, and so my brother and I, uh, in like second grade, really didn't have a choice. We were going to be uh, musicians, and then he was supportive enough that after we mastered clarinet and French horn, uh, respectively, he let us, uh, you know, start a rock band uh, in high school, and then in college, I, I did some singer-songwriter uh, things, uh, and I made a promise to myself. Uh, that at some point I would actually record a proper uh, album. Um, and then thanks to technology uh, and, uh, and uh, Steve Jobs, who I never met, but uh, Steve Jobs introduced a, a, a software program on Macintosh computers in 2004 called GarageBand. Mm -hmm. And it was a full recording studio on your Macintosh computer uh, pretty simple by today's standards, uh, but it was essentially gave me the entree to start thinking about uh, recording my own music. And I was also writing music through this time, so my hobby is to write write songs. And so it was a labor of love. It, it has 10 songs, and it took 10 years, so about a year a song. Um, and I worked with some of the best professional mm. uh, re musicians in the world. Right now, one of the conveniences is you can record with top session uh, musicians uh, at different times in different rooms in different time zones. You just send them your digital versions mm. of your songs and they record their part. You then mix them all uh, uh, together. Yes, and so I decided once I got 10 songs, I would release a proper uh, album. And so, yeah, it's on, on YouTube, Spotify, <laughs> uh, Apple Music, uh, iTunes, yeah. Well, great. So that was during your first tour with Film Call. Yeah. Well, now you're back to film call. So any chance that you might think of a second album? Oh, already? yes. I'm, I'm at work on the second album. I have five of the songs uh, finished. Wow. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I, I will say, you know, to the American taxpayer, I was not working on my album while I was fed by his chair. Uh, at, sometimes to, to, to relax uh, at night, I would strum guitar and write some songs, but yeah. I didn't record any songs for the new album while I was fed Vice Chair, but but I'm back, uh, but I'm back uh, at it. But it's really refreshing and soothing when I listen <laughs> to those. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, John. And, and and to just end this question, um, I, I must say that I was really struck 
by um, the very strong predictive power uh, about market behavior or market sentiments. Um, actually, uh, two songs stood up uh, uh, <laughs> very uh, in particular. One is Take Too Long. Take too long. Okay, yeah. so uh, which reminds me, the market thought that okay, you've really taken central banks too long oh, to yeah. realize that okay, <laughs> this time round, the inflation was not transitory. Okay, yes. so that's uh, the first I, song. I, I, I think I forgot. I don't know if I mentioned or not, but yes, I was a charter member of Team uh, 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 Transitory. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't. I never connected that with uh, with that song, but. Uh, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> and we'll, we'll see whether this makes sense. Also, the second song is actually Gone Too Far. Gone Too Far. Okay, okay. so <laughs> now think about just not long ago, people, as you said, expected mm -hmm. that uh, the Fed should actually start cutting rates very soon. Oh, wow. Boy, you know, I will say, I, I had not thought of this connection, but that would be a good, <laughs> that would be a good soundtrack if ever, ever I do a documentary of that period. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well done, Richard. Well done. Um, so we have a bit of a time that we can open to uh, the floor for questions. So um, when you do so, please you re raise your hand uh, and then let us know your name, your affiliation. And in the meantime, if there's anyone that you want to do it via the, um, the, um, the dial-in, um, just uh, send in your questions. Uh, OK, so that gentleman, please. Global Ratings. Hi, Louis Kaus, S&P Global Ratings. Hi. I had a question, Richard, about the start of your conversation about uh, a possible change of a, uh, the, the target yeah. that the Fed has for inflation. Some people say it's not such a problem to have 3% inflation. Other people worry about the implications for inflation expectations and volatility. So my question to you is, how likely do you think that the Fed will eventually end up changing its target? And what could be the implications if they were to do so? Thanks. Uh, great question. So Very quick question. Keep oh, we're going to do multiple? Back, right? Okay. Okay, good. All right. Are, okay. are we going to take multiple questions? Or oh, maybe we'll just go ahead one? with this one. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, there, there are two issues. Uh, uh, one is, um, you know, will the Fed consider uh, raising uh, its inflation uh, target uh, or other central banks, uh, and, 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 and in the end, will they do so? The, the Fed uh, has said that it will, uh, on a regular five-year basis, uh, have a review, an internal review to assess its framework. Chair Powell asked me to, to lead that effort in 2019 and 2020, mm -hmm. and he's also said that they will do uh, another uh, assessment uh, beginning next year and, and then releasing 2025. Uh, the chair has also been asked uh, if uh, he would support raising the inflation target to 3%, and he said uh, no. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't happen, but it does mean that I don't think they're inclined to do so. Uh, my thinking on this is, is as follows. Um, I am certainly in a, agreement with a lot of folks who recommend a higher inflation target um, that uh, in the abstract or with a clean sheet of paper, uh, would it make a lot of sense uh, to do so? And the answer is yes. You know, the, can the economy function with an inflation rate of three about as well as two? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think so. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, you know, global central banks in, in advanced economies have coalesced around aiming for a 2% uh, target. Um, and I think it would be institutionally costly to the Fed's reputation to change the target after a prolonged period when it missed the mm -hmm. old uh, target. Uh, more, uh, more, in a more interesting dynamic to changing the target, which I think has not been fully assessed by many folks, is a lot of the folks advocating that the Fed raise the inflation target now are advocating because they think it would let the Fed uh, run an easier monetary policy, you know, hike rates uh, by less, uh, for example, or maybe cut rates sooner. I think what they don't recognize is that right now the, the bond market is pricing in that the Fed will succeed in getting inflation down to two. And you can see that by looking at break-even inflation in the inflation index market. So counterfactually, if the Powell Fed were to say, you know what, we've listened to our critics, you know, 4% inflation's fine, we're gonna stop rate hikes, 
I mean, almost certainly you would see a substantial sell-off. Bond yields would go off. You know, risk assets would sell off. Um, and it would probably hurt the economy and slow the economy now. So I think, I think there is path dependence in monetary policy. I think the best policy going forward is a function of the policy that you've had in place. Uh, that's not to say that you should always be a hostage to the path for policy. But I think on this decision, I, would, I, I wouldn't see the Fed adopting a higher inflation target. What I could see, however, I could see the Fed um, uh, focusing on communicating its framework less in terms of a number and more in terms of a range. Uh, in, in, in essence, saying monetary policy that is successful is a policy that keeps US inflation between one and a half and two and a half percent, mm. or one and three quarters and two and a quarter percent, centered on two, but essentially reflecting the reality that the world's most successful and accomplished central banker with a 2% target is, is most of the time going to have inflation that's not exactly 2%. There are always shocks. And I think conveying success in terms of a range uh, centered on 2% uh, and not a, a number is something that the Fed might uh, consider. Uh, but I don't, I don't see them, uh, I don't see them uh, uh, endorsing uh, a higher uh, target. Yeah. Meanwhile, I think the, ma the magic word is average. Right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. So this gentleman. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, this is Freddie Wong from Invesco. And I would say stick with the same topic of uh, inflation. While well, inflation certainly uh, should link strongly to money supply. And if you look at consensus versus the sort of like New Keynesian's uh, view around uh, tight labor market, uh, oil energy prices, commodity prices, or you know, chip shortages, or even though some of the fiscal support arguably very um, uh, sort of stimulatory. So to some extent, uh, money supply that's been explained by M2 uh, has been coming off from developed market. And of course, China will be in a different sort of like economic cycle. So in your view, how would you see, well, we can certainly apply that to explain why the asset price has been performing in the last six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. But looking forward, what do you see when that kind of slowing down in the money supply to impact asset prices across different asset classes, mm -hmm. fixed income, equity, you know, yeah. uh, alternative. And from a risk perspective, uh, what make you actually worry the most that you couldn't, may not sleep at night so that you can spend time waiting song? <laughs> or actually, you're not, you're not worrying any kind of risk that make you sleep well? Thank you. OK, so um, the, when I became an assistant professor back in the 1980s, the first the first class I taught was, was money and banking to college uh, sophomores. Uh, and um, and, and I've, I've often thought that if I ever had to teach money banking again, I'd have to you know, tear up all my old notes from 40 years uh, uh, ago, because so much has happened uh, then. Um, the, so the relationship between monetary aggregates and inflation is obviously one that's been uh, studied. It's one a subject on, on, about which people have very strong uh, opinions uh, and, and, and views. Uh, you know, my own thinking, and I think my own thinking is representative of the feeling uh, at, the, at the Fed, at least uh, when I was there, um, is for a variety of reasons, the historical stability of the relationship between money and activity uh, really began to break down pretty substantially um, in the 1990s. Um, and, and, and continuing. Um, it is true that in the, well, first of all, let's go back to the global financial crisis. We had a period uh, when there's pretty rapid growth uh, in different monetary uh, aggregates um, that in the end did not produce a, a lot of uh, inflation. Um, um, it's also true in this cycle uh, that we had a record increase in, in uh, the M2 uh, monetary aggregate and then eventually we did get a lot more inflation than the Fed wanted, although again, not in a particularly stable relationship. Velocity actually declined uh, a lot, it was very uh, volatile. Uh, the, the thought, ex that what I've done both when I was at the Fed and since is, is consider the following thought experiment. It, essentially what we had in the US and to a lesser extent in other countries, 
is we had a policy response which combined both a monetary uh, piece uh, and a fiscal piece. And in particular in the US, the fiscal piece took the form of basically sending out checks to people uh, to support their incomes uh, during what was uh, a, a very, very challenging uh, period. And at the time, I thought it was not, I thought it was appropriate and, and said, you know, certainly said so in particular, the, the CARES Act. So, so the government sent out a lot of checks, okay? Uh, and, and those checks were gonna be received regardless of what the Fed did. Now the Fed simultaneously did QE, and what that meant, so the government sent out the checks and then initially it paid for them by selling bonds, okay? So the net effect is bondholders have treasuries and people get checks from the government. The Fed then stepped in through QE and it bought a lot of those bonds and paid for them with bank reserves, um, and so the people, instead of who financed the checks by holding bonds, now hold checking accounts at banks, which essentially paid close to zero interest, as did the T-bills uh, that the government was issuing at the time. Um, and so it's very difficult to know how much of the support in the economy and the, and the subsequent surge in inflation was due to the checks or due to the balance sheet. Uh, my own view is that it, it would be hard to see the economic recovery that we got had there been no checks sent out, but the Fed just bought a lot of existing uh, 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 debt. Um, I guess you can write down models where you would have gotten that response, but I think a much more plausible response is that we got a very robust um, and inflationary uh, recovery uh, because we sent out a lot of checks um, much more the number of checks that were sent out than the way they were financed. The, the important point is that QE, uh, the modern form of QE in which central banks like the Fed pay market rates of interest on bank reserves, QE is not printing money like we used to teach when I did money in banking decades ago. Um, it is essentially printing a T-bill substitute so T-bill does not, QE does not reduce the stock of government debt, it just changes the maturity composition from fixed to, uh, to, to floating. Now, it is true we had a lot of checks sent out, we had a, a big expansion of the balance sheet, and so if you, if you have a strong view that it's balance sheet versus checks, you know, the data itself is not going to change your, your mind, but that's certainly uh, where, I, where I come down uh, on, on this, but certainly ex post in the US, the amount of accommodation in, in the system, both through the Fed's QE and low rates and through the fiscal expansion, you know, relative to post pandemic aggregate supply uh, was excessive and that together generated the inflation, you know, that we've seen. Okay, thank you. Now talking about um balance sheet, actually. Um, maybe I'll just reserve one question for um, people sending a question mm -hmm. online. Yeah. Uh, okay, now this question reads, why does the Fed require regulated entities to mark their portfolios to market, but the Fed doesn't apply the same principle to its own balance sheet? And does it matter that the Fed has highly negative equity under this scenario? Okay. Well, the Fed does the, the Fed does report uh, the Fed does report the unrealized losses on its security mm. uh, portfolio. Um, it doesn't pass them through to the calculation of Fed equity unless uh, the, the securities are sold uh, before uh, uh, maturity. The the consequence of the Fed uh, having a portfolio now that has a lower income stream than the payments on reserves uh, is that the Fed now does not remit, uh, po does not have positive remittances that go back to the uh, 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 Treasury. Uh, the, the way the Fed accounts uh, for this uh, is that it, uh, uh, it, it creates a deferred asset which recognizes that in the future when the Fed is again profitable so that coupon income exceeds uh, payments on reserves, that the Fed will withhold uh, remittances to the uh, Treasury until that capital uh, mm. is um, is uh, is restored. Uh, so um, you know why the Fed does that. That that that's the way the Fed does um, account for it. You know it has no implications 
directly for monetary policy, uh, but it does have implications for the remittances that the Treasury receives from the Fed. Mm. Um, and, as, and as folks can learn, if you look at the data, you know, QE ex post was very profitable uh, for the Treasury uh, from 2008 until 2020. I think the total remittances from the Fed to the Treasury were in the range of a trillion uh, dollars over those, those years. So any calculation of, if you will, profit and loss uh, has to be has to be looked at mm. in across the entire uh, in, in the entire uh, experience. That said, I don't <laughs> think we want to see another QE. Right? <laughs> uh, we have maybe have time for one last question. I see yeah. a, that lady. Yeah, please. Thank you. Th thank you, Richard. Uh, Kamini from RGA. So coming from the life insurance industry, uh, low interest rate environment is a significant headwind to us. Yeah. Um, and interest rate did like it's rising. I mean, rapidly uh, recently with the uh, thirty-year U.S. dollar Treasury now standing at four uh, percent. What is your advice to the leadership in the life insurance industry, oh. and what is your outlook of the uh, long-term U.S. dollar oh. interest, uh, long-term U.S. interest rate in yeah. the medium term? Thank you. Sure. I uh, so. So the PIMCO view developed at our, our forum in May, which, we, which we've written up on an essay on, on PIMCO.com, uh, is that, uh, again, now focusing on US rates, we, we, we do think that, that neutral Fed policy rates, so the, rate, the federal funds rate the Fed would set, the Fed would set when inflation's back to target. Um, uh, we agree with the Fed right now that that neutral rate is more or less in the range that it was before the pandemic, say two and a half to three uh, percent. Um, however, we do think the post-pandemic rate world is going to be different from the pre-pandemic rate world because we think we're in a world of steeper treasury uh, yield curves uh, with a positive term premium that treasury investors uh, can uh, earn. Uh, and 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 in, a, in, a, in addition, uh, we do think at the margin uh, that we will will see less QE from central banks going forward than we have in the past. And and so for, for because there's a lot more sovereign debt investors need to hold, and because we think at the margin there'll be somewhat less QE, we do think we'll be in a world in which policy rates are more or less back to pre-pandemic levels, but yield curves are steeper. So I would assume that hmm. from the insurance perspective, that would be a good thing, uh, but that would be up to you to man manage that <laughs> risk. But, but that's, that's where we think we, we may be headed in the next three to five years. Okay, well, thank you so much, Rich. So, well, this has thank been you great. So much. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, so we really uh, run out of time. And, and thank you again uh, very much for um, your very insightful sharing. I think um, we all have um, uh, a lot of take away uh, from this discussion. And I'm hoping that um, out of your very busy schedule, you could still find some time okay, to see what uh, Hong Kong can offer to our business. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no, I'll, I'll be back, that's for sure. <laughs> and next time when you will release your uh, second album. Oh, maybe, uh, maybe do the uh, record <laughs> release party here. <laughs> OK, very good. Thank okay. you, Gerald. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.